I want to teach you today about righteousness. And righteousness in the eyes of God. Righteousness means right standing with God. And God makes us righteous through His Son, Jesus Christ, when we place our faith in Him. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1. I may scream, I may holler, I may, I may not. I want you to learn something today. I want us to dissect and rightly divide God's Word. The reason I like Galatians chapter, or Galatians, the book of Galatians, and well, it's in God's Word, I, number one. No other book has taught me more about righteousness than Galatians. And so we're going to go through this book, this letter. I don't know how long it will take us, maybe six weeks, maybe seven weeks, probably ten weeks. But um, when we get through, we'll be through, okay? And uh, I'm excited to go on this journey with you. Galatians chapter 1. Now, this is a letter. You know, we call these books in the Bible, you know, Genesis, Leviticus, Judges, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, you know, all the way to Revelation. We call these books of the Bible. But there are some that are, or most actually, or a lot are letters, especially in the New Testament, are letters. Well, this is a letter written to the people of Galatia. That's why the 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 title of the letter is the letter to the Galatians. If you lived in Galatia, you were a Galatian. Kind of like if you live in Willacoochee, you're a Willacoochian. And so Paul writes this letter to the Galatians. Now Paul was a missionary. He was a traveling preacher. So he comes to Galatia to preach to them led by the Holy Spirit to Galatia, and he preaches the gospel to them. And you know what happens? People got saved. People were born again. But something happens. These Paul, as a traveling preacher, after presenting the gospel to them and spending time with them, he leaves. Churches rise up. Churches are built. God is doing a great work. Paul leaves Galatia. After he leaves, he gets a letter from some of the people there in Galatia. And the letter says this, help. False teachers have came in and they're teaching another gospel. They're teaching something different, Paul, than what you taught. And we'll see in just a minute, this isn't something that Paul took lightly. This is something that Paul took very seriously. And so in response to what he heard, he writes a letter back to the Galatians for them to get their eyes back on Jesus. You see, this is the gospel. This is the message that the false teachers taught. This was it. They didn't have a problem with Jesus, but they didn't believe Jesus was enough. So they said, if you really want to be righteous... You really want to be in right standing with God, which is what righteous means. You want to be in right standing with God. Then we want, you need to mix Jesus with Judaism. Mix Jesus with the law, with law keeping. And to mix, if you mix it, then you've really got something and you'll really have a good relationship with the Lord, you'll really be in right standing with God. But the, that could not be any further from the truth. Listen, the gospel is simple. One ingredient, Jesus. The gospel is Jesus plus nothing. The good news, the gospel The gospel, we talked about it last week. The good news is this. He who knew no sin, Jesus, became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. He, I'm going to say it again. Here's the gospel. He who knew no sin, perfect. 
became sin on the cross for us so that we could be made righteous. Who did it? Jesus did it. And the Bible says that we receive this righteousness by grace simply because God is good through faith. You say, well, Pastor, I don't know if I've got faith. I don't know. The Bible says every man has been given a measure of faith. And you're already putting this faith to work. You're putting it in something. And you know what most of us, all of us, our default uh, place of faith is putting faith in ourselves. But the grace of God that comes to us awakens us to this fact. I don't need to put faith in self because self is a sinner. And if I'm a sinner, I need a Savior. And Jesus is the Savior. So Paul finds out this news and he says, well, I've got to get you back on track. And Get your focus back on Christ. So he writes a letter. And he writes this letter to the Galatians. This is his response to finding out about these false teachers. And let me say this. This was serious. This was pretty, you know, these Judaizers, these false teachers, were wanting them to go back into Judea, or wanting them to. They had not been because they were Gentiles. They weren't Jews. Wanted them to go and embrace Judaism Embrace Jesus and mix them together. What they wanted the men to do. You say, well, you know, is it that big of a deal? It it really is a big deal. Every male at eight days old was circumcised if they were a Jew. These false teachers, teachers were saying, hey, if you really want to have a relationship with God, you need to be a Jew. And, by the way, the first thing you need to do to adult men, first thing you need to do is you need to get circumcised because that's what real Jews do. And if you really want to have a real relationship with God, then that's what you really need to do. And you know what they did? They lined up to be circumcised. Why? Because they really wanted to have a real relationship with God. Can I tell you something? There's only one way to come into relationship with God, and that one way has already been done by one man. He's paid the price. You can't pay the price. You, I said, you can't pay the price. The price was impossible for you to pay. In fact, you didn't have the right currency. You say, well, what was the currency? The currency was perfect blood. You ain't got perfect blood. Ever since Adam and Eve, your blood has been tainted. You were born with tainted blood. That's why children. You don't have to teach a child to sin. You don't have to teach a child to lie. You don't teach a child to steal. No, you're always correcting them. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't say that. Don't do that. Why why does it seem natural? Because they're born tainted by sin. Ever since Adam and Eve fell in the garden. So what's the answer? It ain't you. You know, humanistic psychology says you can fix you. You can fix you. If you'll try harder, if you'll work harder, if you'll stop doing this and do that, you can fix you. You can't fix you. You are the problem. He is the solution. Pride in you. I I can do it. You know, that's been the root of all evil, pride. Root, that's where all sin is springs out of, I can do it. I, I, I'm good enough. I, I got this. I don't need Jesus. I, I don't need, I, I can do it. I, 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 I. Sin blooms from pride. People will die and go to hell. Ushered in with pride. Pride will take people to hell. You know, you say, well, you know, what's the sin that takes people to hell? Gambling, uh, lying. What is it, Pastor? Pride. I'm enough. I don't need nobody to help me. I, I got this thing. I'm good. 
Pride will take you all the way to the gates of hell, but pride will drop you off there because there ain't nobody in hell got pride. I can tell you, everybody in hell will say, I was wrong, he was right, the preacher was right, my mama was right, my daddy was right, but my grandmama was right. Pride will leave you alone by yourself. There's no pride in hell. Pride will usher you to the gate. These people, these Judaizers, these false teachers were full of pride. They assumed because of the way they were born and how they were raised that they had a closer connection. They, had a, they, had, they really had the goods. But when Jesus died on the cross, there was no more Jew or Gentile. Slave or free, male or female. When Jesus died on the cross, you know, even the presence of God, we were separated from as, as, as humans. But when Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says when he cried out, it is finished, that the veil that was in the temple that separated man from the very presence of God, when he cried out, it is finished, supernaturally the veil in the temple was ripped from the top to the bottom, symbolizing this, you now have access to God through what my perfect son Jesus Christ did on the cross. Can I tell you? Can I ask you, where else would you put your faith then? Would you put it in you? Would you want to put it in me? Would you like to put it in the church? I tell you, no. There's only one place to put your faith and put all of your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you. And there you find salvation. There you find victory. There you find freedom. There you find deliverance. There's not a drug too strong. There's not a lust too strong. There's not a bondage too strong there's not a lot that he don't have the key to he's the answer his name is Jesus Christ the son of the living God anybody in here know what I'm talking about no matter the problem he is the answer he is the solution hallelujah if I'm guilty of anything, I want to be guilty of pointing you to Jesus. Paul had a revelation of this. Paul was given this revelation by Christ. So Paul writes a letter. He's left Galatia now, but he's got to respond to what's going on. Because these false teachers are creating turmoil, confusing the people. So Paul sits down and he begins to write a letter with his own hands, his own writing. And he starts out in chapter one, and there were no numbers, there were no chapters. This was a letter, but man's put numbers to help us refer, reference different parts of this letter. But it starts out like this Paul. An apostle, not from men or by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. First of all, I want to point something out right here. And by the way, this is our textbook. This is what we're using, the Bible, okay? Bring it with you. Look what verse 1 says. Paul said, I'm an apostle. You see, these false teachers were not just trying to attack the message, but they were also going to attack the messenger. So Paul wanted to let them know, hey, I'm called by God. Notice what he said. He didn't say denomination called me. He didn't say man called me. He didn't say I filled out some credential, uh, some paperwork online and I got me a preacher's license. He said I've been called by God, not by man. And this God... This, this father is the one who raised Jesus from the dead. Verse 2, and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a greeting. This is a hello. This is a salutation. He said this Jesus Christ is the one who gave himself for our sins to rescue us. From this present evil age. 
would anybody disagree if I said this world seems to be getting more wicked every day? Would anybody want to raise their hand and say, I disagree, Pastor, I think things are getting better. No, we're living in a day, we're right, we, we were told this in, in God's Word, that, that, that what's right would be called wrong, and what's wrong will be called right. What makes sense to born-again man is confusing to unredeemed man. Things so simple as male and female are now twisted. Depravity and sin running rampant. But I want you to look what it says. Jesus Christ, and he explains who this Jesus is. The one who gave himself for our sins. We know that. Say hallelujah. He gave himself for our sins. He gave himself for our sin. Because we couldn't do anything about our sin. To rescue us. Why? Because we needed rescuing. We couldn't rescue ourselves. But what I like is from this present evil age, I can be right in the middle of sin, but sin don't have to be in the middle of me. I can be living in a wicked, evil, wretched world, but I, surrounded by darkness, but I can shine like a light. There should be and will be, if your faith is properly placed in Christ, there should be an absolute difference in you and the unredeemed world. There should absolutely, you don't have to wear a remnant shirt. You don't have to tell people you go to church. You don't have to wear a, 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 a shirt with a scripture on the back of it. You ought, Your walk and your talk and the way you live and the way you think and the way you act should look absolutely different than the ways of of this world, what seems acceptable to the world ought to make you sick to your stomach. I'm just saying there ought to be a difference in the way we live. Why? Because he gave himself for our sins. He rescued us from this world in this present evil world. Wrapped up in sin, we can live a sanctified Spirit-filled, Holy Spirit-led, directed life, understanding absolutely what is sin and what is not sin. You don't have to say, well, I don't know. You'll know. I said, you'll know. He teaches us all things. You'll be able to say, that's sin, that's not sin, that's wrong, that's right. And it's not about your opinion. You, you, you throw your opinion out the window. It, no matter, it doesn't matter what I think or what you think or what he thinks or what she thinks. What does God think? My Lord, my Savior, the Lord of my, what does he say? And whatever he says, that's what I do. That's how I live. That's what I believe. Shout amen. No longer matters what I think. What do you think, Pastor? What does God think? Well, what do you say? What does God say? What does God say? Verse 6. Now, this is the very reason why. Paul writes the letter. I, I took forever telling you why he wrote the letter, but here's why he wrote it. Look what he says. I am amazed, watch this now, that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. There are many today 
who are turning away to another gospel. It's Jesus mixed with something else. You say, and, and listen, I am not talking about whether you should be sprinkled or dunked. It's more important than that. I'm not talking about speaking in tongues or not speaking in tongues. It's more important than that. What I'm talking about is heaven and hell. I, I, I used to say I liked coffee. But I have learned, I'm getting wiser. I don't like coffee. I like creamer. <laughs> I like Splenda. Several months ago, I got this revelation. As I poured that cup of coffee, I was looking for things to make it not taste like coffee. And I say I like coffee, but I don't. I don't. Coffee's bitter. That's why I put Splenda in it. Coffee, I like the steam of it when it when I put it up to my face and and I and I breathe into the coffee and the coffee hits me back in the face. I love the way that feels. I, I, I love the smell of coffee, but I don't like the taste of coffee. I like the taste of French vanilla. I like the taste of hazelnut. I like the ta you know what I'm talking about. I like I get I get you know sometimes in the holidays I like I like the the the, the frosted cookie flavor if you like coffee you don't do all that if you like coffee you just you you just pour it straight out the pot jet black you like coffee no we don't like I don't like coffee I, I add something to my coffee and you know what it does it ceases once I add something to it, it ceases to be coffee. I haven't strengthened the coffee. The coffee was as strong as it could get from the pot when I poured it. But when I, I added something to it, see, we want to add something to the gospel because the gospel kind of cuts. The, the gospel's kind of white and black. I mean, there's no gray area there. The gospel is pure. The gospel is simple, but man likes to take and sprinkle a little bit of this and a little bit of that and let me stir a little bit of this, but can I remind you what Paul said? I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is in its in its simplest form in its purest form the power of God unto salvation you want power power to change power to heal power to be delivered you better stick to the gospel you better find you a church that's preaching Jesus crucified and resurrected because I'll tell you what won't save you and fill you and heal you. The Southern Baptist Church can't do that. The Pentecostal Church can't do that. Huh? The Methodist Church can't do that. I'm not, I don't have anything against any of those, uh, those denominations, but I'm telling you there is only one man who hung on a cross. There's only one man who was crucified on that cross, and his name was Jesus. No denomination gave himself. No denomination was hanging on that cross. It was Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the bearer of our sin, the, ra the ransomer, the redeemer. Christ, the Son of the living God, And I am convinced, I am persuaded, I believe it. Nobody can shake me, change my mind that, the, that Jesus, not sprinkled with something else, but Jesus 
is the gospel. Jesus plus nothing. It's, there's nothing wrong with baptism. You should be baptized. But baptism doesn't save you. Jesus saves you. Oh, 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 well, it does. Baptism does save you, but it ain't got nothing to do with water. Baptized into Christ, being enveloped in Him, getting in Him, and Him getting in you, this saves you. Joining a church doesn't save you. You should go to church, find you a church that preaches Jesus, and go to that church, but church don't save you. There's only one name whereby man can be saved. And I want to say something. This name of Jesus saves you? Pastor, but then tell me what's next. I want to go deep in the things of God. You can't get any deeper than what we're talking about right now. See, these Galatians wanted to go deep. And you know what they found themselves doing? They were standing in the circumcision line. They want to go deep. Tell me some more. Oh. Most of the things that the church calls deep is shallow. You want to grow in your walk with the Lord? You want to become you want to your behavior to line up with God's word and you want to you want your life to look like the life of Christ let me tell you how keep your eyes on Jesus Christ keep your focus on Jesus Christ keep your faith in Jesus Christ you know what the bible says and the bible says in the book of hebrews uh, it says it says you can lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily trips you up. How, Pastor, how? Tell me how. First of all, you've got to quit believing that that's who you are. I'm going to smoke me a little dope now. Uh, Left-handed cigarette. That's just, I, I'm going to do that because i got to do it for my nerves. Some of you don't like me talking about that. See, that's a, you're just a sacred cow to you. You think you like that. It ain't hurting nobody. It's hurting your testimony. It intoxicates you. If you get drunk, you know what you're doing? You're committing a sin. Did you know in Galatians, we ain't got there yet, but in Galatians chapter 5 it says this. It says drunkards have no place in the kingdom of God. They shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You know what that means? That means, I don't think that means just alcohol. That means anything that intoxicates you. Can I tell you if you're popping pain pills, pop, 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 and you can't even walk to Walmart out the parking lot because you're so intoxicated by the pain medicine, did you know what? You're a drunkard. Somebody say amen. You're a drunkard. But I'm here to tell you that ain't who God called you to be. That ain't who you are. That is not. I'm telling you God's got something better for you. God. If you are born again, if you are his child, you are not a drunkard. You are not an addict. You are not an alcoholic. You are not a fornicator. You're a child of the most high God. Tell you what, I don't believe also because God's word doesn't say it. Once an addict, always an addict. That's humanistic psychology. What happened to old things have passed away? And all things have become new. Do you hear what I'm saying? The gospel is what brings change. He said you could lay aside every weight and the sin. I didn't tell you how. It goes on to say this. By looking unto 
Jesus. You can lay aside every weight. Some of you are running around. You can't even run. You're dragging things from your past. You're dragging this bondage and this addiction, trying to go where God's called you to go, but you can't go because you, what you carry and don't fit in where God is calling you to go. But here you are dragging this, dragging that. Some of you got a rope down all the way that leads down to Walmart. You're trying to pull the things of your past. Some of those things cannot go with you. They are weights. And I'm telling you, though, you can lay aside every weight. Lay aside. Wait a minute. Notice what it didn't say. It didn't say, Pastor, anoint you with oil and cast it out. You don't fast it out. Now, Hebrews chapter 12, I think is where it's at. So, it doesn't say fast it out. It says, you can lay... I don't need this anymore. Because where I'm going, this can't go. And who God's called me to be, this don't line up with who God's called me to be. And as you are focused and your faith is on Jesus and you're going where Jesus is calling you to go, you say, "Uh uh-uh, I can't go where I'm going with that. I'm going to lay it down. I don't need nobody to snatch it from me. I've heard people say, just snatch it from me. Sometimes God, well, it'll feel like God snatched it from you. But can I give you a Bible? It ain't God snatching it from you. It's as you are keeping your eyes on Jesus, God's doing a work in your life, and the Holy Spirit's doing what you cannot do for yourself, and you will find yourself saying, I don't need that anymore. What you thought you couldn't live without, you're realizing you never were living with. Shout amen. Amen. And so you lay it down. I don't need it. You can lay aside every weight. Shout every. That means every weight. And the sin. Oh boy. The sin. The one that easily trips you up, causes you to stumble, causes you to fall. You can even lay aside that sin. How? By trying harder? Mm Mm-mm. By trusting more. It says looking unto Jesus. That doesn't mean you find you an artist to draw you a picture of somebody you think Jesus looks like. And you hang it on your wall and you stare at it. That's not what looking unto Jesus means. Looking unto Jesus means I have nowhere else to look. He's the only one with strength. He's the only one that can help me. He's the only one that has delivered me. I'm looking to him for my help. I'm looking to him for my strength. I'm looking to him for my hope. I'm looking to him. I can't look to man. I can't look to the church. I can't look to the preacher. I can't look that I can't look to them, but I can look to him, the one who has never failed me, the one who has never let me down. I'm gonna set my gaze upon him. I'm gonna look to him. I'm I'm going to run after him. I'm going to focus on him. And as I'm focusing on him, falling in love with him more and more, I fall less in love with the world. No, you just got to stop sinning, Pastor. You just stop it. The only way you can stop it is to place your faith and put your dependence on Christ and what he has done for you. Because when you do that and your focus is on him and you're dependent on him, then the Holy Spirit goes to work in your life. After you get saved, you don't say, okay, I'm good now. Done. I don't need your help, Holy Spirit. I don't need your empowerment. I don't need your direction. I've got it now. No, you know what you've got? You've got a brand new will. You got a brand new will. You want you you want to please God now. You never had that will to begin with. You weren't born with a will to please God. You were born with a will to please yourself. 
But when you're born again, you're born with a new will, a will to please God. You want to please your Father because you've been made a new creation. But you still lack in within your own ability and your own strength the power to accomplish this will. So where, where do you go? You look unto Jesus. You place all your dependence on him. And you will begin to lay down, lay aside every way. This is the gospel. He said, I got to close. He said, verse 6, you're turning to a different gospel. And, and you would say, I would say, if I just stop there, so there's another gospel. No, look what Paul says. Not that there is another gospel. But there are some who are troubling you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Look at me right now. Man's religion doesn't bring you peace. It brings you trouble. And there are some who want to trouble you. There are some who want to mix the gospel with your, uh, with man's religion and sprinkle a little bit of this and a little bit of that, a little bit of human, humanistic psychology and, 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 and try to mix it all together. But I'm telling you, that will not bring you peace. That will not bring you freedom. It will bring you bondage. It's a form of godliness, but there's no power there. So what do you do? You just change your behavior. See, in these religious circles, we modify our behavior. There are some of you in this building, you modify your behavior. You act a certain way when you're getting around a certain group of people. You modify your behavior. That's religion. So if you're around these people, you act this way. If you're around these people, you act this way. If you're around these people, you think like this. If you're around these people, you think like this. And you've just modified your behavior. But there's, the gospel doesn't modify behavior. It transforms hearts. It's not behavior modification. It's heart transformation. That's what the gospel offers. That's what I'm preparing at the table today. That's what I've laid out here today. It's the gospel. I have, if it's not appeasing to you, if it's not appealing to you, That's all that's out at this table. Because that's the only thing that can change lives. And I'm not willing to put this church and build this church up on anything other than the gospel. Because the gospel is the only thing that will stand. And if it's built by man, it's going to come crumbling down. If it's built by charisma or it's built by good speech or eloquent words, then it's going to come crumbling down. But there is a truth that will stand when everything else is crumbling and it's the word of God. It's the gospel. And once again, I echo the words of Paul. I am not ashamed of this gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation and the gospel has a name and the name is Jesus Christ. Paul takes this seriously. He says, but even if we or an angel, verse 8, from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, a curse be on him. As I've said, and I'll say it again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, a curse be on him. And then Paul said, am I trying to persuade people? Or God, am I striving to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want to tell you something. In your effort to please God, you're going to rub people the wrong way. And these false teachers were not just attacking the message. They were attacking the messenger. And they said, Paul's just trying to. You know why Paul didn't mention this other stuff? That's what they were saying. You know why he just talked about Jesus? is because he's just trying to be a people pleaser. Wait a minute. Preaching Jesus has never pleased people. 
See, no, what they're trying to do is please people because what they're trying to do is mix the two. Law and religion. Jesus, can't we just make everybody happy and combine them? Paul said, if I was trying to please people, I would not be preaching Jesus. And let me tell you something. I want to help you. Some of you are some of the first people in your family to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. And you go home every weekend back into a house that doesn't believe God, doesn't hold on to God's Word. Some of you, every friend you have, your circle, everyone around you, no one is looking at life like you look at it now. No one sees things the way you see them now. You feel like a stranger and you're tempted to kind of back off just a little bit to please people. Hear me. In your effort to please people, you're damning their souls. I dare you to be absolutely, completely different than everybody you're around. I dare you to absolutely be radical in a world that is unseasoned. I challenge you to be salt. In a world that seems dark, I challenge you to be light. I challenge you to stand on the word of God. If God says no, say no. If God says yes, say yes. Stand true to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah, but it may make some people mad. I'd rather people get mad temporarily than be sad forever in hell. I'd rather people see Jesus in me by me loving them and loving them enough to tell them the truth. May this place be a factory making disciples who will not back down from the truth of God's word. I love you enough for you to be mad with me. For a season. And I want to tell you in your effort to please people, let me tell you what you're going to do. You're not going to empower people by pleasing them. You're going to enable people to keep living the life they're living. It's okay, man. It's not okay. I'm not telling you to go to them and say, you mean you're you feel them flames, boy? You feel them? On your toes, your feet getting hot. I'm not telling you to do that. You one step away from hell. I'm not telling you to do that. But the facts are and reality is, they are. What I'm telling you to do is stand on God's word. And let your life be an example. Let your words, I'm not saying be silent, preach the gospel. You don't need a pulpit to preach the gospel. You tell them what Jesus, the, God is going to give you so many opportunities to share. He don't, it's his will that no man should perish. And if you're walking in the power of the Spirit, you're walking in purpose and on purpose. Everywhere you go is an opportunity to share Jesus with people. You don't need this pulpit. You don't need this platform. Trust me, you don't want it. You've got something that the world needs. Don't try to please people. Please God. I'm almost done. How the devil keeps flipping my pages. I'm joking, it ain't the devil, it's my arm. But For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel preached by me is not of human origin. For I did not receive it by a human source, and I was not taught it, but it came by revelation of Jesus Christ. For you've heard about my former way of life in Judaism. I intensely persecuted God's church, and I tried to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond many contemporaries among my people because I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my ancestors. You see, Paul wasn't always living for the Lord. In fact, Paul was the very opposite of someone who lived for the Lord. He was killing people who were serving God. He was having people arrested and murdered for serving God. 
The Bible says he was on the Damascus Road one day to have people arrested, people who were serving the Lord, people who believed Jesus was the Messiah, the promised one, the resurrected king, and he was going to arrest these people. And what happened? Jesus came to him on the Damascus Road. I'm talking about the Jesus that had ascended already up into heaven. I'm talking about he's already been crucified. He's already been placed in a tomb. He's already rose again. He's already spent 40 days and nights here on this earth. He's already ascended into heaven. He's already taken a seat at the right hand of God. And this Jesus, years later, comes down and presents himself to Paul and it knocks Paul to the ground, the glory and the power of Jesus Christ knocks Paul to the ground and Jesus says to Paul, why do you persecute me? And right then at that moment, Paul knew everything he thought was absolutely wrong, that Jesus Christ was the son of the living God. He did die on the cross. He did rise again and he realized he was messed up. He was on literally on the wrong road, headed in the wrong direction and Jesus came to him. And that day he gave his life to the Lord, and you would have too. Amen. Yeah, well, in fact, ain't that what happened to you? You were on the wrong road, headed down in the wrong direction, doing the wrong thing, and Jesus presented himself to you. Now, I just want to remind you, there's probably nobody in here that's been putting Christians to death. So no matter what you've done, and even if you have, no matter what you've done, where you've been, how long you've been there, Jesus Christ can forgive you, cleanse you, wash you, make you brand new. He can take away the shame, take away the guilt. He can break the bondages of addiction. Who can? Jesus can. Jesus can. What do I have to do? You have to place your faith in the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And the moment you do that, you will be made brand new. He said, I was doing all these things. I was having these Christians killed. I, I was, I, be, I thought Jesus was the greatest fraud that, that had ever been. Nobody was more zealous than me about Judaism, believing that the Messiah had not come, that we were still waiting on him to come. Nobody fought against Jesus more than me. Verse 15. But when God. Ah, oh, there it is again. But when God. Aren't you glad? That no matter what you've done, I'm talking to saved people now, no matter how bad it was, aren't you so glad you had a but when God experience? <laughs> but when God. Stand with me all across the building. I want you to understand something. Chapter 1 is, and we're not finished with chapter 1, but it's an introduction. And in 2 and 3, he's going to begin to, get, begin to get into the meat of God's Word, meat of the revelation of Christ. But 1 and 2 is Paul's personal testimony of grace. Chapter 3 and chapter 4 is Paul's teaching on grace. And chapter 5 and chapter 6 is how we apply the gospel this grace that we've been given, how we apply it to our lives and make it practical and give it to others. I want to tell you that a moment when Paul was full of, I'm right. Can you imagine? I'm right in doing this, going down this Damascus road. I'm going to have people arrested full of zeal. Can you just imagine that moment though when Jesus gets up off the throne 
comes down and the instantly blinds Paul, knocks him to the ground. That was a moment he would never forget. Have you had a moment with Christ that you'll never forget? I mean, you may not remember the date or the time. But you know you had a moment. If you don't know, and you don't can't, have I had that? Because, see, it changed Paul. I mean, he wasn't killing Christians after that. He started preaching the gospel. He started telling people, I'm wrong. I was wrong. Man, I was wrong. He's right. His way's right. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. I consider everything. This is Paul's own words. Paul said, I consider everything I learned before knowing what I know now. I consider everything I knew to be dung, to be waste compared to what I know now. Have you had that kind of moment? Hear me. I'm not talking about that. That's not joining a church. That's not water baptism. That's not being dedicated and sprinkled as a child. That's not some religious rite or ceremony. I'm talking about have you had a but when God moment? Because if you can't say, I know when it was. I know. I, 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 I remember it. And it has changed my life. See, you can be raised up in church but never raised up in Christ. You can know all the books of the Bible but not know the author. Have you had a this changed everything moment? If not, can I tell you he's here? And that moment and that opportunity is available right now. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, the Bible says nobody can come to Jesus unless he's drawn by you. And Father, I pray right now that you would draw hearts, draw men, draw women, draw students. I don't, I don't want nobody to go to hell, but God, your desire for people to live goes beyond my desire and my capacity to even have compassion. I can't have compassion like you can. It's your desire. It's your will that they live, that they make you the Lord of their life, that they repent of their sins. They say, I am a sinner. The way I've lived is wrong. It's wrong. You're right. Your way is better. I turn from my old way of living. I turn from my old way of thinking. I turn for thinking from thinking I was right. I'm not. I'm wrong. I've been living. I've been living as if I'm Lord. As if I'm God. Doing what I want, when I want, how I want. headed down the wrong road doing the wrong thing going to the wrong place Father draw men and women right now I ask you to do this in Jesus name Amen Church now look at me if there's anybody in here and God's dealing with you if God's dealing with you if he's, if he's, if he's, if he's I don't even know how to put it because it's such a this drawing, it feels like your heart racing. It feels like your heart stopping. It feels like sweating. It feels like chills. It feels like anxiousness. It feels all these things combined. It feels like I want to grab hold of the seat and never let go. It's a, I can't wait to get out of here. I don't, I don't want to leave. It's all these things combined. But you know what I said was truth today. Are you willing to walk out and hope you've got longer? You know, the Bible says that we should say, I don't know what I'm doing tomorrow. We should say, we should say, if the Lord wills. 
Our plans mean nothing. He sets our agenda. He calls the shots. And if the Father's drawing you, I don't know if he'll draw you tomorrow. The Bible, because the Bible says there's coming a day when the Spirit won't always strive with a man. I don't even, I don't know what that means. It sounds scary to me, though. That there's coming a day where his Spirit won't always strive with man, won't always draw man, won't always interfere in man's activity. So what he's doing today, if he's drawing you, must be a moment, a special moment. I think you should take advantage of that moment. If you feel God drawing you and dealing with you, you should say, God, here I am. So that's what we're going to do. If you feel God drawing you, I'm going to ask, instruction is this. If you feel God dealing with you, I'm asking you to step out of faith and come to this front and say, I need, I need the Lord. I need him. He's drawing me. I don't want to live another day without him. You feel God dealing with you right now. They're going to sing this song as they sing. No, you know what we're going to do? No, we're not going to do that. This is what we're going to do. Okay, well, come on up here. Hallelujah. Well, this is what I want you to do. I want you to look to the person to the left of you. Some's already coming because when you feel that drawing, you just need to come. I want you to ask the person to the left of you, to the right of you, maybe in front of you or behind you, and say, hey, if the Lord's dealing with you, if you need to go to Jesus, I'll go with you. Ask them that right now. And if, if they say, yeah, I need to go, take them by the hand and let's come. Let's come. You're not coming to join the church. You're coming to Jesus. Ask them right now. Come on. Yeah, give God praise. They're coming. Come on. Come on right here. Come this way. Come on down. Hallelujah. High within our hearts. High within. Can you lift your hands and say, So we lift you high. Forever lift you high. High within our heart, high within our mind, Jesus, you alone, our rock, our cornerstone, high within our heart, high within our soul. Listen, I want everybody to look at me. Look at me right now. If you're down at this altar, look at me. Look up at me. It's okay. Look up at me. This is your but God moment. Is this a family over here? This is a family over here. A whole but God family moment we're going to pray together all of us are going to pray together and you're going to this there's, there's no such thing as a, a sinner's prayer we say that a sinner's prayer can sound like I'm wrong you're right I need you it can sound like this. Jesus, help me. What's important is you take your faith now and take all of it and place it in Jesus. No longer is it in me and you and yourself or anybody else. You can't do it. 
He can do it. He's done it. And you can place your life in His hands. You can trust Him. You can trust Him. Tears down at this altar, but there's not sad tears, are they? It may be sad about how I'm sorrowful that I'm wrong and I was wasted these years, but can I tell you something? God's took these years and used them to get you here to this moment. It's not wasted. But let it be tears of joy today that Jesus loves you so much. Are you ready? Let's pray. We're going to pray out loud. We're going to pray out loud. Say, Lord, Lord here I am. I heard the word. I heard the word. I believe it was for me. I believe it was for me. I believe you're dealing with me. I believe you're dealing with me. You're drawing me. You're drawing me. I take my faith. I take my faith. My trust. My trust. I place it in you. I place it in you. I believe you died for me. I believe you died. Taking care of my sin. Taking care of my paying sin. Paying the penalty for my sin. Paying the penalty for my sin. And I believe you rose again. Defeating death, defeating sin, defeating hell, and defeating the grave. You told me in your word, if I believe in you, if I trust you, I shall live and not die. Forgive me, Lord, of my sins, the way I've lived, the things I've done. I repent. I turn away from sin, from the way I've lived, from the things I've done, and I turn towards you. My life is not my own. My life belongs to you. I make you the Lord of my life. From this day forward, things will never be the same because I'm not the same. I'm forgiven. I am saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give God praise.